Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Um, don't laugh, but I am keen this morning and to draw your attention to that story about the massive uptick in insomnia. I'm having some technical problems in the studio. <laughs> I do apologise at the top of the programme. I think I might just have sat on something. But anyway, we will be turning our attention to that story about insomnia, which some of you, of course, could contend that this programme is a cure for. Uh, we will be looking at a moment at the key to Brexit, which in my mind I've just discovered in the most unlikely of circumstances on children's television in Ireland. And... Well, before that, I'm drawn to the question of university. This is, you're going to have to forgive me if I seem a little bit distracted. I, I can't hear my own voice at the moment, but I'm reassured that you can hear mine. So I'll be right with you. Don't worry. <laughs> if it's actually, it's, 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 you're the lucky ones. You can hear everything I'm saying, and I can't hear any of it. But the, the, the bottom line is that um, we're beginning to assemble a list on the programme, as you know, of things that I... Fear, I'm basing my opinions on knowledge from 20 or 30 years ago. And uh, what was on the list last week? Drugs, video games, similar issues like that. I've suddenly realised I don't actually know what I'm talking about. I've got a sneaking suspicion that universities might actually be similar, that university education might actually be something that my opinions are based on 30, 40 years, well, 30 year out of date experiences that need now to be. Uh, improved. Five minutes after ten is the time. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where finally I've got technical... That was my fault. I just need to apologise to the million people currently listening to this programme. I came into the studio, I plonked down my newspapers, and I accidentally pushed a button that turned everything off. So I was sort of like broadcast... It's entirely my fault. I want to make that absolutely clear. I don't want anybody getting into any trouble at all for what must surely constitute the least professional two and a half minutes of radio that I have ever been involved in. And my goodness me, there's plenty of competition for that time. So we're back in the room. Whew, that's a relief. Oh, how reassuring it is to hear my own dulcet tones coming out of my earphones. It's, it's, that was a really odd... That was a bit like deep-sea diving. You know when a massive explosion goes off in a film and then you get that weird ringing noise afterwards and everybody's head is sort of resonant? That's what I just felt like for me. But uh, I should probably acknowledge this point that that was, that was literally only me, so I won't talk about it anymore. What we'll talk about instead is... Or what we'll attempt to talk about instead is, is a twofold question. One is going to sound a little bit odd. The front page of the Daily Telegraph today, which, as you know, is my, my late father's old newspaper, so I still hold a, a, a softish spot for it, albeit that it's um, descending into a very, very weird and ugly place at the moment. They've got a massive picture of Boris Johnson's swollen head and uh, a big brouhaha about his plan for Brexit, which is utterly reheated codswallop. Uh, that's not even an opinion anymore. Uh, there's absolutely nothing in it that constitutes original thought or, or plausible proposal. This is the moment he blusters to change the course of, of, of negotiations. A, a collapse of will by the British establishment, says an old Etonian who was Foreign Secretary for two years. Let's just pause for a moment and think about that. There has been a collective failure of government and a collapse of will by the British establishment, says an old Etonian former Daily Telegraph journalist who has been Foreign Secretary for most of the last two years. That in a nutshell, is an emblem of the mess that we've allowed men like him to create. He, he is casting himself as a, somehow an antidote to the collective failure of government and a collapse of will by the British establishment. This is a man, of course, who wrote two columns in the run-up to Brexit, one of which was going to encourage people to vote for it, and one of which was going to encourage people to vote against it. He was then gifted one of the four great offices of state in an attempt, presumably, to make him deliver the cake that he'd promised the British public they would be able to both have and to eat. He did absolutely nothing during his tenure as Foreign Secretary, except uh, make the plight of Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe even worse than it was already. The man blushed, well, he was probably too busy, I'm afraid to say this, but I will, because it's me, he was probably too busy with his extramarital affairs to get on with his Foreign Secretary duties. 
I get quite cross when I talk about Boris Johnson, I've noticed. And the main reason for that is that he's still here. That This is the really sad indictment of British public life at the moment. You look at all of the people who've led us into this mess and the relationship between actions and consequences is lost on all of them. Liam Fox resigned or, or essentially got hounded out of office as Defence Secretary in absolute disgrace. Just sit still, old boy. Sit still, hold your horses, you'll be back. I, I, I can be a bit sententious sometimes, I appreciate that, but, and it's probably due partly to my religious education. Uh, it's drilled into you from a very early age when you're taught by nuns and monks that you will be punished when you sin. But actually, it's what holds societies together, the relationship between actions and consequences. It is what effectively um, all parents try to teach to their children. As I get older, and I look at the world that my children are inhabiting, I wonder whether I'm doing them a grave disservice by teaching them not to be liars and not to be cheats. Because we seem to be creating an environment in which liars and cheats are winning and prospering. And seeing Boris Johnson's swollen head beaming out from the front of the Daily Telegraph this morning, selling a reheated raft of lies that he's already peddled and utterly implausible nonsenses that he's already sold for a quarter of a million pounds a year several times over to the owners of the Daily Telegraph. It, it, it saddens me deeply on a personal, not just a political level, because you sort of find yourself thinking, what have we become? Ian Duncan Smith, when he became Conservative leader, it turned out that his CV was a farrago of fibs and exaggerations. His actual CV. Oh, don't worry about that. Sit still, old boy, you'll be back. And he was, as a Secretary of State under David Cameron and George Osborne's government. And now, of course, as one of the chief buffoons of Brexit. So Liam Fox, disgraced. Ian Duncan Smith, fraudulent CV. Boris Johnson, has lied to every employer, every wife and every lover that he's ever had. And those are long, long, long lists. And yet they just sit still and then they come back. They get rehabilitated into public life. It struck me, actually... Earlier this week, how many of the key Brexit uh, proponents are profoundly fraudulent and dishonest men? Nigel Farage, of course, even lied about an assassination attempt. <laughs> it can't really get much grimmer or much more pathetic than that. But they're all still banging on about somehow this being plausible. And one of the great mysteries, I think, for people like you and me, who still <sighs> somewhat vainly hope that charlatans, frauds and liars... Um, will get their comeuppance. There's a bloke on Question Time last night who accepted a police caution for ass assaulting his pregnant girlfriend. And can you imagine if somebody of the left or liberal had accepted a police caution for assaulting one's pregnant girlfriend and suffered precisely zero professional consequences? A man, actually, uh, who counts Andrew Neil, the BBC's interviewer-in-chief, among his employers. And Boris Johnson talks about the establishment. <laughs> The establishment, what, what is the establishment, if not a collection of charlatans, snake oil salesmen and self-interested people like Boris Johnson? So where are we going with this? I'm not quite sure, actually. The Boris Johnson angle is why. Why are we still listening to this man? 03456060973. And I know I leave myself open immediately to the criticism that I am part of the problem I describe, but I'm going to resist that criticism, even though it's probably fair, because I, I, I might not ever talk about him again after today. I, I, I just find myself thinking that we're, we're, we're keeping a... We, we, do you know what we're doing? We're reanimating a corpse every time we allow Boris Johnson to contribute to the public discourse. Uh, Brexit is now a corpse. Uh, the question is whether or not we end up with it or whether or not we somehow managed to avoid it. But, but every single aspect of Brexit that people were persuaded would improve their lives has been proven to be um, wrong. Not necessarily dishonestly wrong. Some people made genuine and honest mistakes. Some of those mistakes could have been avoided over the last two years if Theresa May had not triggered Article 50 so quickly and if she had had a proper understanding of many of the key issues and if she hadn't been surrounded by men who had already come back from disgrace and dishonesty. That's really interesting, you know, actually, when you, when you think about it. The number of key Brexiters who had a record of deceit and disgrace. These are not men who care about being found out, you see. It's, it's the only way you can make sense of that corpse being reanimated now on a weekly or a daily basis by the likes of Boris Johnson, David Davis, uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg, 
um, Liam Fox, all of them are men who somehow see public shame or public disgrace as a temporary hiccup, which is a sign of entitlement on a scale that most of us don't understand. Oh, no, 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 no. People, people like me don't have career-ending embarrassments. People like me just have temporary humiliations from which we return and pretend they'd never, ever happened, which is the only way in which I can make sense of Boris Johnson being on the front page of the Daily Telegraph today, spouting utter gibberish. Now, I'm going to play you a little video from an Irish television programme for children. It's, it's called News Today. Listeners of a certain age will be reminded of John Craven. For my money, this unpicks everything. For, for my money, this... It, I mean, what's amazing about it is twofold. The first thing that's amazing about it is how bang on the money it is. The second thing that is genuinely amazing about it is the fact that such a simple and comprehensible explanation of where we are and why we are where we are seems to me, and I could be wrong about this, but I don't think I am, but it seems to me to be completely absent from almost all British coverage. You know that I have struggled for some time to get any prominent Brexiters to appear on the programme. They are, of course, all welcome. The phone number remains the same every single day, 0345 60973. But if, if, if they were to do so, I think I'd just play them this before every interview and say, look, let's just establish... This is from children's television, so apart from Nadine Dorries, everyone's going to be able to understand it, right? This is from children's television. It lays out the most simple of facts, and if you uh, diverge from or deny any of these simple facts, I'm going to blow a large siren in the studio and insist that you return to reality. So... I'll play it to you immediately after this little break. It's two and a half minutes of children's television from Ireland that appears to betray a better understanding of where we are and why we are where we are than David Davis, Liam Fox, Boris Johnson, Jacob Rees-Mogg, Nadine Dorries and all the rest of them have managed to conjure up between them in the course of two and a half years. So I will give you, after this, two and a half minutes of children's television that knocks two and a half years of Brexit bloviation into a cocked hat when it comes to comprehensibility, accuracy and honesty. Don't go away. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Well, I think we have two questions. The first is, how has Irish children's television managed to understand and explain Brexit better than any Brexiter? in the last two and a half years. And the second, and I genuinely mean this, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Why are we still listening to Boris Johnson when he's been utterly exposed as um, a lying cheat? 03456060973. Your answer to that will really interest me because it may refer to the class structures of Britain. It may refer to curiously deferential... Um, uh, attitudes that remain in place, or it may, it may be something completely out of the blue, but why are we still listening to, to a second-rate journalist with a history of deceit and deception and cheating? Why? Why is Boris Johnson still afforded respect in this country? Uh, he, he ran away from the mess he made when he resigned as Foreign Secretary. He could, of course, have done a million things to avoid what he describes as a collapse of will by the British establishment and a collective failure of government because he was in that government and he was not loyal. So, you know, the silver lining of his utter inability to think about anybody but himself would have been that he could have publicly explained what Theresa May was doing wrong because he never ever buttoned his lip out of loyalty, did he? So he hasn't even got that defence. Well, I couldn't say anything when I was in Cabinet because, uh, you know, loyalty and all that. <laughs> You've got a fruit bowl that's more loyal than Boris Johnson. So those are the two questions I want. But first, you need to listen to this chap, Paul Cunningham, who is RTE's political expert, going full John Craven on a television programme for children. Now, there's been a lot of talk in the news about Brexit recently, and you've probably heard a lot of words like backstop and checkers. But what does it all mean? Well, here's one of RTE's political experts, Paul Cunningham, to explain. The word Brexit means that Britain is exiting or leaving the European Union. The British people voted in favour of leaving the EU in June 2016. But the date Britain will actually leave the EU is March 2019. Both the British and the EU are now trying to agree on what relationship they will have after Brexit. The EU has a single market. This means stuff made in Ireland can travel around the EU without any checks or regulations. Britain still wants to be part of that after Brexit. 
If Britain chose a deal like Norway, it would be outside the EU, but still able to use the single market. But it would mean that people as well as goods could travel freely across borders, and Britain doesn't like that. If Britain chose a deal like Switzerland, it could still use the single market, but it would have to obey the same trade rules as the EU, and Britain does like that. Britain wouldn't have the problem with rules, courts and people if it had a trade deal like Canada. But it would only have limited use of the single market, and Britain wants more than that. The British Prime Minister, Theresa May, has another idea. Her plan is known as Checkers. She wants a better deal than Canada, but without as many rules. However, last week in Salzburg and Austria, the EU told her this Checkers plan will not work. The Irish government is worried about what's going to happen between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. They want a backstop. That's an unbreakable agreement that there will never be a physical border in Ireland, whether there's a deal or not. When you cross the border today, no one stops you to ask for your passport or to look in your car or any trucks. Both the Irish and British governments say they want this to remain even after Brexit next year. However, if Britain wants a deal like Canada, then the EU will want to know what stuff is crossing the border. Both sides are trying to work out how to do that without having to have checks at the border. Both sides agree there should be a backstop, but they can't agree how it will work. If they get that sorted, they'll have longer to work out a trade deal. But they only have a few weeks to sort out the backstop. The clock is ticking. And of course, one of Boris Johnson's suggestions is to deny reality and to somehow start conducting trade negotiations when you don't know the terms of the trading arrangements you're going to have with the European Union. I mean, this is one of those days where you, you realise the full scale of the mess that these men have made of our country and still they refuse to admit it. And that, that is the double strand of the conversation that I want to have with you today. So question number one, why is Boris Johnson still a thing? Uh, a, a man who has been uh, absolutely definitively exposed as a liar and a cheat, okay? And yet still he sees himself as a prime minister in waiting. I, I, I want your sociological and historical explanation of why. What have we become as a country that a man so utterly devoid of integrity, honesty and talent can still be seen by so many as a king across the water? And if you are one of those people, I, I, I'll make you a promise, I'll try not to bite your head off today. I will try to engage ears more than I engage fangs, all right? Because I, I want to know, especially if you see yourself as, a, as, as someone who believes in morality, or maybe even as a Christian, someone who believes in the sanctity of marriage or the importance of fidelity and honesty. What is it about this peculiar, pathetic figure that inspires so much admiration in people who really should know better? That's question number one. And, and if we get to the bottom of that, hopefully we can continue our conversations together every day without ever having to talk about this clown again. Second strand of conversation will be this curious state of affairs whereby an Irish children's television programme can display a deeper and more honest understanding of the British state, or indeed the state of Britain, than any of the men who have caused Brexit. 10.25 is the time. Ian is in Leeds. Ian, you can kick us off. What would you like to say? Hi, uh, yeah. Um, I think what it is is that in an age of increasingly bland politics, Boris Johnson has stood out and he's made himself a brand. You know, his very appearance, the way he speaks, where he, his buffoonish behaviour, it's all that, game that, plan. Yes, that, that would have answered my question a year ago, wouldn't it? But, but, but yes, I'm thinking but more but, now of the mess that he has made since then. And, and his, you know, he got into the cabinet and he soiled himself and then he ran away. And he still retains this curious, I think he does at least, I don't know whether anyone who buys into that idea will... Um, ring in to explain it to us, but it can't just be that. Otherwise, you might as well, you might as well have put Jimmy Cranky in the cabinet for all the personality attributes you just listed. Well, uh, well, uh, then, then I think it's also then the mixture of uh, of the deference as well and lack of political education that goes along with it, because so people don't well, realise what a fraud he is. Then, well, because exactly. they still think their unicorn's going to arrive by Christmas. And they, and they look at Boris Johnson and they think that he's the man to deliver it. You know, it's like when you hear certain... When they say that certain people can read a telephone directory and they can make it sound interesting. Yes. 
So, you know, you, you think of someone you know, who's got a well, rich... OK, then why doesn't it work on you, then? Why doesn't it work on you and me? It did work uh, on me once, I, I'll be honest. I, I, I'm not embarrassed by this. I don't think anybody's perfect. Um, although my new book is called How to Be Right. The, 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 the Boris Johnson charm worked on me when I was less informed and, and, and less political, and I was still it, in it, this job. So why didn't it work on you? I think, well, I've worked in sales in the past, and I can smell uh, BS perhaps, maybe a bit more than others. And now we're back to this um, uncomfortable analysis where you and me are calling everybody else on the other side sort of gullible or thick, which I don't want to do. Well, I'm not calling people thick. I think it's what well, people uneducated want to believe. is what you said. Well, well I, th well, I think everybody could do with more political education, to be honest. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I do. Wish I, had more, I, wish I wish I had more when I was at school. I wish I had more uh, now, and perhaps well, it's the people who think yeah. they've got lots but actually have the least who explain the Boris Johnson phenomenon, the, the, the people with the strongest opinions and the least knowledge and understanding. The people who perhaps have just listened to that clip from Irish children's television and gone, oh my gosh, I don't understand any of it, and then they have to tamp down that thought immediately and, and resubscribe to the notion that the bloke on the radio doesn't understand anything and I know everything because oh, I was on a forum last night on the internet and I got 17 likes off other gammon. Craig's in Birmingham. Craig, what would you like to say? I'd just like to say, James, the bar has already been set by people like Peter Mandelson. I'm not defending Boris. Uh, I think he's a bit of a muppet myself. But the reason you've got these kind of people in politics is because we always turned a blind eye to bad behaviour. Yeah, I mean, Mandelson was certainly someone who came back from disgrace two or three times, but I would have described him as anomalous in the context of previous governments, whereas if you look at Brexit in particular, they've almost all got flawed records, uh, deeply flawed records. But I think everybody has. I mean, Mandelson's very heavily on Remain side. Um, and yet well, no, but, mate, you're, talk, you're talking about someone that hadn't been in the House of Commons for about 14 years by the time... Uh, well, by today. By, I mean, 12 years he hadn't been in the House of Commons. He was not a prominent Remain campaigner. I'm looking at the men who led it. I'm looking at Boris Johnson. I'm looking at Liam Fox. I'm looking at Nigel Farage. I'm looking at all the men who were the, the prominent Brexit campaigners, all of whom have moral CVs that are despicable. And we yeah, still go along with it. Look at Tony Blair. Look at Tony Blair on the Remain Mate, side. Tony, Tony Blair was not involved in the Remain campaign. Yeah, but he was a former Prime Minister. Okay, so I'll mean, tell you what we'll do. You just make a list of all the ex-Labour politicians that you don't like, and then we'll start talking about the people that were actually heavily involved in Brexit, mate. Okay, so Philly no, Booth. I think you're confusing me because I'm not actually. No, it's probably very easy. Anybody. Yeah, but no, no go on, just Tony talking. Blair, Peter Madison, who else? Gordon Brown, or was he all right? Was he okay? Keir Hardy, Nye Bevin. Kind of stand -up kind of person, no, Nye Bevin. You... Anyone else? Well, at the end of the day, there aren't such things as politicians, I don't think. So the prominent Remain opinion. campaigner with a record of deceit and, and fraudulence and cheating, who would you go for first? Who would I go for first? Um, I would say that actually they all lied. Yeah, go on, just, just give me the big ones. The ones who had a record of cheating on their CVs, cheating on their wives, lying to the public, making up assassination attempts, getting dismissed from the cabinet in disgrace. The prominent Remain campaigners who fit any of those descriptions. Fill your boots. Not oh, Jeremy Corbyn. <sighs> I don't know. OK. What, what, what yeah. are you accusing him of? Well, no, so you're, you're describing him. As, you're describing yeah, Jeremy yeah, Corbyn yeah. as a prominent Remain campaigner, are yeah, you, Craig? He, he, Craig, mate, you yeah, need to go he, and have a lie down in a dark room. It's ten thirty-one. I, 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 there have been many examples of the sheer scale of the fraudulent hypocrisy that we <laughs> seem to have turned into a national sport at the moment. My favourites is probably the Barclay brothers, who own the Daily Telegraph and the Ritz, and bankrolled. Uh, a bunch of buffoons to tour the country claiming to be speaking against elites and speaking <laughs> against the privileged. That's the owners of the actual Ritz Hotel. And they're the men who today have paid Boris Johnson to write an article which talks about the collective failure of government and the collapse of will by the British establishment. And in many ways, I'm asking a question I've asked you a million times today, which is, how come some people still can't see that the emperor is naked? How can a man who has been gifted every advantage that life in modern Britain can afford, from, from pretty much the moment of birth, uh, right through to today, he has had every privilege that money and inherited entitlement can buy, which is, well, it's not fine, actually, but it's certainly not a reason to dislike somebody. He's got no control over the circumstances of his birth, but it is important to point out he could not have been given a more silvery spoon. 
And he has also been Foreign Secretary for two years. So how can he possibly talk about the British establishment or the British government in pejorative terms when he is a poster boy for both? Answer, he thinks you're stupid. Question, why can't you see that he's naked? Answer, oh, well, Peter Mandelson got into trouble as well. What? See, poor old Craig, the reason why he just came such a cropper on the radio, I'll explain, because I don't enjoy seeing that happen. It's something that works on Twitter or social media. So I say on Twitter, how can people think that Boris Johnson is anything other than a barefaced liar? And on Twitter, you can say, oh, yeah, well, Tony Blair's a war criminal. And you think you've actually landed a point or you think you've actually said something substantive or interesting. You haven't. You've just essentially belched with consonants and vowels. But on Twitter, because you're not prepared to think about the question that challenges the con that you've fallen for, on social media you can say stupid things like that. Or you could say, oh yeah, you're only saying that because George Soros pays your wages. And then you sort of sit back looking all gammony and smug and you don't realise that you've said something really, really thick. And that's why Boris Johnson still has an awful lot of support, because people who hate thinking are still buying whatever it is he's selling. And what's he selling today? The idea that a man who's been foreign secretary, who went to Oxford University and Eton, who ghosted his way into various jobs on various newspapers through patronage and promotion, despite getting fired from his first gig for making up a quote from his own godfather, he can somehow today cast himself as a doughty enemy of the government that he's just left and the establishment that he never will. Why do people fall for it? James is in Faversham. James, what would you like to say? Hi there, James. Um, I think it's got a lot to do with notoriety. I think that we live in a culture of notoriety. I think we've got you know, did we, did we always that base have, their have, entire have, yeah. uh, way of promoting themselves or selling themselves to people based on, you know, small scale, uh, we call them small celebrities and that lot, um, uh, basically doing bad things and getting themselves constantly into the public eye. So being you know, bad has being become good. All the time. And it's, so, so when you come to think, oh, who do I want to vote for? Who do I want to vote for? Oh, I know that name, Boris Johnson. Or I whatever. saw something I many years ago. I, I can't remember exactly when, and I, I may get my dates and details wrong, but I don't think it will affect the central thrust of the observation. I, I, was, at a f I was at a function somewhere in daytime. I think it was at the House of Commons. Can it have been? Well, anyway, Neil and Christine Hamilton were there, right? Yeah. And... They were celebrities by this point, if, if you will, as a direct result of public disgrace and humiliation. Yeah. And the school children who were being shown around on a school trip were excited to see them because they recognised them off the telly. Yeah. Is that what you're talking about? That's basically what I'm talking about, but I think, you know, even the news, the tabloids and things... Do and and, well, and yeah. Neil Hamilton's oh, another one. Covers. He's, he's um, getting a wage off the taxpayer again, isn't he, down in the Welsh Assembly, despite having had to resign in utter... Oh, he didn't even, did he yeah. even resign? I think he got chased out of town by Martin Bell, didn't he? Uh, yes, I believe so. <sighs> so, <clears throat> my problem then becomes, is this new? Is this new? Yeah, is um, it new? are we looking at... Because there's a danger. Are you similar in age to me? There's a danger of thinking that we've... I'm, I'm 61. How are you? You're a spring a chicken, older. then. Well, then you're better qualified than I am to answer this. Do you see this as a relatively recent development? Because I'm always conscious of not having um, a close enough eye on the rear-view mirror and thinking that, oh, this is new and this is... A, but really, you well, know, twas ever thus. These papers... I mean, I think the tabloids have been doing it for quite a while. I think that, you know, papers like Hello, OK, and all that, I've been doing it for quite a long time. Mm. Um, but it does feel relatively new. Do, to me. Do, 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 the they reward, do they reward badness? I, I appreciate you can become famous for doing nothing for the size of your posterior or a, or a self-released yeah. sex tape. But it, it's well, not—it's not moral bankruptcy that these magazines celebrate. I mean, you only have to look at, I suppose, things like bands that go to hotels that no, maybe they're not as good as perhaps they should be as a band and they go smash up a hotel room and they get reports in the paper and people go, oh, whatever, I like that band, I know that band, whatever. That's, I suppose, another flip side of it. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it's a thought. You're, I'm not going to necessarily carve it into stone and <laughs> stick it on the top of Mount Arafat at the moment, James, but it's, 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 it's I mean, it's, you speak, there's a, there's a nugget of truth in there. Probably quite a big nugget, actually, but it, it again, it... It involves casting people who we currently disagree with as being credulous fools. And, uh, well, maybe that's where the Emperor's new clothes analogy becomes irresistible. Maybe they just are, but then I want to know why. Why? Christopher is in South Norwood. Christopher, what would you like to say? 
Yeah, I would like to say that I think that your attitude is quite condescending. And I, I'm, I'm really um, I'm concerned. I don't, I've never called to your program. I don't even know who you are. But the key that I just heard in my call was Hang on. trying they, to they, understand. They, I'll tell you. My, my name is James, and you're, well, on, L, you're on LBC Radio, and you Tremendous. just, yes, and, and you're very welcome. And I'm sorry if I seem so, condescending, but I, I, yeah, I know who you are, and you phone my show. That's incredible. Yeah, so the issue is that Boris Johnson has been, has run for political life. There are many people that voted him as mayor of London. I'm, I, I, can I, 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 I'm very sorry, because you probably think I'm condescending again. Can you slow down slightly? It's not a brilliant phone line, and I, 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 all I heard from the last two sentences was mayor of London at the end. Okay, can you hear me better now? Yeah, if, still slightly, but start again. So I'm saying that for all of those millions of people in London who voted for Boris Johnson, mayor of London, yes. and now as an MP in Parliament, you are trying to give us some sort of perspective that he's some sort of weird character that you don't understand how he become he become so popular. No, not at now, all. I don't know. Not at all. Okay. No. So I, what what, I, what I don't understand is, for example, let's okay. talk about the people. Where, where's his constituency again? Is it not Uxbridge? Uxbridge. The people who voted for him in Uxbridge because he said yeah. that if the third runway at Heathrow was passed, he would lie down in front of a bulldozer. And then on the day that the third runway at Heathrow was passed, he finagled a trip as Foreign Secretary so he didn't even have to be in the House of Commons. What I'm struggling to understand is how people cannot think that that is evidence of the type of man he is. Can you help? Yeah, the, the evidence that you're looking for is very nebulous, and I think... I, I said, no, I but no, no, it's because... not nebulous at all, because it's on the record. I will lie down in front of a bulldozer if the third yeah. runway at Heathrow so, goes ahead. So he was not then, in the country at the time. No, but he, he was, was in the, he, he, he was yeah. a member of the cabinet. Yeah, uh, another minister, a government, official government business. Another minister who'd made the same pledge to his constituents in Chelsea resigned. That, that is called being honourable. So we Boris know... Boris was overseas on official government business so could not vote. What's the issue? Well, he could still um, have resigned in protest. Well, he... L like he the other minister. Say, I well, heard him say... Like the other minister he, did. Yeah, but he said if he was in power, he'd better to be able to fight his cause and resign it. Everybody wants to resign and not uh, abdicate. No, no, your there, there was, there was literally a minister in the same government. Well, you're getting who, off your point. The point. No, no, we're not, Christopher. Voted... I'm sorry that no, you no. feel condescended to, but I'm beginning to think it's not my fault. The point here is that Boris Johnson repeatedly displays deeply dishonourable traits and behaviours. In not... your opinion. In it's, your no, opinion. No, no, it's not my opinion. His wife just it's left him because opinion. he cheats. His, his wife opinion. just left him because he cheats on her. It's not the mayor, people who voted for the mayor's opinion. It's just your opinion. And you've never run for political no, no, life. These are all facts. And you have the coach to be able to say things over the air because they have a very cozy studio. Go so, around the So do you, Christopher. You're, you're now saying things on air and you're getting a bit embarrassed because you're being a bit silly, but that's not I'm my not fault. I'm embarrassed because there are many people in this country <sighs> that believe Boris Johnson has but, charisma. But I don't dispute that he has charisma, but he's dishonest. Yeah. yeah, so who is it? Are you honest, more honest than Boris I'm Johnson? I'm not asking for your vote. And yes, okay, I am more honest. Issue. I am more well, that's honest. The issue. You I, have I, hang on, I'll, I'll answer your question. I am a lot more honest than Boris Johnson. Okay, and, and I'm happy to. I'm happy to have that tested that, by I any measure. You, anyway, how can you ask me you these say. questions? You don't know who I am. Yeah, but listen, you don't know who Boris Johnson is either. Can you make an aspiration of his character? Yes, I do. I've been. I covered his entire mayoralty. Fantastic. He was a very popular mayor. I what was his greatest achievement? What was his greatest achievement? There's an echo lifting in the it. profile, lifting the profile of the of London as a city. No, no, in, in terms a of a policy, of in terms of a policy, what was his greatest achievement? You can look at many things of policy well, that he on, was then. able to achieve in terms of the police. Look at transport. Lot of the lot of the issues in terms of the base there's of 20, there was twenty thousand fewer police when he left office than there were when he started. Yeah, but I'm not talking about the so police what was in, his, terms in terms of, of in terms of policy. Of what was his greatest achievement? Yeah, OK. What you're trying to say to me... No, no, what I am saying to you is what is yeah. his greatest achievement politically? My opinion is different to yours. Yes, I know, but okay, I'm not interested in your fine. opinion. I'm interested in fact. Yeah, it's a subjective question. Calm what down, I Christopher. For, what were... was his greatest policy delivery? In my opinion, yes. I said you housing. What? what, 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 what? In my opinion, housing. What, what, what on housing? But don't get into these things. Beautiful How many houses did doctors. he build? Or let's get into the issue of Boris Johnson, Christopher. because you have an issue with Boris Christopher. Johnson. He's Christopher. more than you, Christopher. and he will get more votes than you as a leader of the, the Conservative Party. Christopher, I'm very, I'm very happy that you've discovered me. Now, if you could discover chamomile tea, it would be the day of days. If you are feeling stupid, get angry with the people who have made you do stupid things. Don't get angry with the people who have pointed out the stupid things that these stupid people have made you do. And then we could all get on brilliantly after a nice cup of chamomile tea. Two questions before us today. Why is Boris Johnson still 
still a thing? Why, why is a man who has been given every opportunity to make a success of the Brexit that he did more than any other to sell to this country, been allowed the oxygen of publicity and the front page of the Daily Telegraph to offer up an utterly bogus alternative plan to the utterly useless plan that the Prime Minister has been forced into championing when he has nothing professionally, morally or personally to recommend him except charisma? Why? Why are we still doing it? And while we're on the subject, how can he be permitted to talk of a collective failure of government when he was in it for two years, the third most senior, the fourth most senior member of it for two years or more, and a collapse of will by the British establishment, of which he is a perfect paradigmatic example? What's happened to us as a people? 0345 973 is the number you need. And... Thirdly, and I'll play it again, I might stay with this for a little longer than an hour today. Um, thirdly, how can an Irish television programme for children have displayed a deeper understanding of Brexit than anything that we've heard from David Davis, Liam Fox or Nadine Dorries? How? How, how has that happened? And, and no one's answering that question yet. Everyone's focusing on Boris. How, how do you think, as an observer of such matters, maybe you're listening in Ireland, on either side of the border... Um, how do you think it's happened that two and a half minutes of television presenting for children by, by a grown-up journalist, by a political commentator who doesn't normally speak exclusively to children, how has that ended up being better informed and more illuminating than anything you've heard from any of the key people behind the Brexit vote? I, that is just staggering, genuinely staggering. James is in Oxbridge. James, what would you like to say? Hello, James. First time caller. Nice to meet you. You're very welcome. <laughs> have you, ever, have you ever heard of me? Have, the passion of the last caller. Have you ever heard of me before? I have heard of you, unfortunately. Oh, but, um, right. no, I thought, I'm, unfortunately. I'm not quite as... Uh, Go on. But no, so Boris Johnson, unfortunately, is my MP. Right. The unequivocated disaster of a man. But um, the thing is about our speech, it's not aging population. It's within one of the safest Conservative seats. The interesting thing and the point I want to make is they made a 25% majority pretty much consistently over the last 20 years. It's always been a Tory seat. Yes. The last majority was just 10%. I think it's 5,000 votes. Uh, yes, and I think it's one of the one of the constituencies that Owen Jones's merry band of, of activists and campaigners have yeah. targeted as, as actually being winnable. It's not it's not a brilliant phone line, James, so I, I, I don't want to... Sorry, I'll stay, I'll stay with you. The issue I have is that Boris Johnson has absolutely no place for whatsoever. He lives in Islington. And he's never that, but again, him. that's not unique to Boris Johnson. And there are, there no, are plenty no, no. of MPs who, who don't really dedicate much time to their constituencies. Boris what, what, what no, in a nutshell, because very... it is a poor phone line, what, it, it, what explains his appeal? Because they can't all be furious ignoramuses like, like um, no, Christopher. No, it appeals to older people. He used to present Have a Good for You. He's a big character. Oxford is in a very well-known town. They sort of feel my parents, other people's parents, I know I'm 23. Yes. They all feel like Boris puts on the map. Oh, he has a bit of foul jest okay. about him around here as well. He yeah. turns up to the pubs once a month, has a beer, takes some pictures, turns yeah. up to the old RAF base, he turns up to the local sports centres and golf clubs. It is, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a pa paternalistic, patronising mode of politics, but it works because... In my opinion, people the like... issue I have is, is that I think we need a campaign. We have a university in this town. We have Bruno University, 13,000 students. My question is, how many students there have registered to vote in Uxbridge? I bet you it's a tiny percentage. Most of them will be from Portsmouth, Southampton, Birmingham, all around the country, even foreign, and they won't register to vote here, which they have a right to do. The issue is if 13,000, let's say, look at the local polls, maybe 7,000, 8,000 are going to be Labour voters. That's going to be a massive majority for Labour. And I wish someone would stand up and make a campaign for students to do that, because when I go to the pub and when I go out, I speak to everyone, and 8 out of 10, 9 out of 10, James... Uh, Labour's forces is just the thing with my age group. We're sick of austerity. Uh, yes, We're sick uh, of his condescendingness. Uh, we can well, I, I get well. Uh, uh, lots of people get accused of condescension. It's not necessarily always fair. But uh, but equally, I, I mean, I don't know how much you listen to the program, but I, I'm not not yet persuaded that Labour has got the needed answers to many of the problems that you describe, but I do fully accept that Jeremy Corbyn is currently the only major leader who seems to acknowledge the existence of those problems. Something that became unerringly clear yesterday when Theresa May was reported of having told people who are struggling at the moment that they simply need to work harder. Um, some good news from one of our callers, actually, who, who, who secured a job. Do you remember one of our callers yesterday who was working three jobs, Nathaniel? Um, he's tweeted me this information. I, I, I won't over egg the pudding because I haven't cleared it or checked it with him. But but he, he seems as partly as a result of, of being heard on the programme yesterday to have landed in a in a much better place than he was in when he rang us. Ten fifty five is the time. Marty is in Belfast. Marty, what's going on? 
Good morning, James. Hello. Just before I uh, uh, say something, I have a friend that lives in London that mm. might be able to get poor Christopher something stronger than chamomile tea. Well, I, I think it might take something a bit stronger. Yes. <laughs> well, it's a little early in the day for that, I think. It, it, it depends what time you get up, dear boy. It depends where you are in the world as well. <laughs> well, well, well how do we Can look I... from, from Belfast today? Uh, it's, oh, it's, uh, it's a mess. But can I take you back in history to the start of your show, your first caller? I think you answered your own question about you know, why do people still listen to Boris Johnson whenever you said that previously when you were a little bit less politically aware, yes. you had a different v- uh, version yes. uh, or a different thought about him? Well, I mean, and I'm very privileged in that my... Um, experience of him is personal. I've, I've, I've interviewed him and spoken to him and I've, I've seen the mask slip and I've seen the act collapse. Same with Farage, of course. But, but uh, that perhaps is part of an answer to the question, but it casts me as saying, oh, well, I know the truth and you people don't, and that's not a good look. Well, it may not be a good look, but you like to deal in facts and it is a fact that a lot of the nation are not politically aware. Go back, I think it was uh, one of the LBC reporters at the Labour conference mm. was showing members of the public photographs of the Labour front bench. I was astounded whenever the names of who was on the photographs came out that I, these people didn't know them. I think How a lot, a lot, a lot of us would struggle. Them? I know the names but, and I know the faces, but putting the names to the faces, it, 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 might, it might actually be a struggle for people who even like to think that they're neck deep in politics. So you're moving towards the suggestion that people like Boris Johnson because he's prominent and they've heard of him and they can stick a cross in a box for somebody. Make... Exactly the same. Yes, that's exactly it. And for the same reason, they, they keep wheeling Tony Blair out because he's a well-known face. Yeah. Regardless of which... But he, he, you want he excites to much more negativity than positivity, I think. I mean, the lens of social media makes these things hard to judge, but it's very hard to find people. Matt Ford's rather good at it, the, 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 the comedian and TV presenter, but prominent champions of Tony Blair are quite thin on the ground. Champions of Boris Johnson. He's on the front page of The Telegraph again today. Yeah, but, but it, is, there such a bad, uh, is there such a thing as bad PR? The fact that they're still wheeling yeah. Tony Blair out to talk about whatever the subject happens to be. It, he's a brand. Boris Johnson is a brand. One of your earlier callers mentioned about it being a brand. Yeah, and it just yeah you're onto to something there. The more there. people are on TV, the more people of the, the public seem to gravitate towards them. It's scary. It's so really There's, there's really a laziness scary. then, which, which responsibility for which goes goes much deeper than, than punters and consumers. I mean, to be fair, as I mentioned at the outset, the owners of, of the Daily Telegraph, who also own the Ritz, are paying Boris Johnson a quarter of a million pounds a year for this hogwash. Um, yeah. And it, it's not really a commercial justification for it, so it must be delivering something else. And what it's delivering is status and access. And the more appearances you make and the more prominent you are, the more status and access you accrue and the better payoff your bosses get for paying you a quarter of a million pounds a year to publish bilge like this. Yeah, but uh, oh, you know, the only days. thing is, eventually, they all get to find out. I mean, you're having this conversation about Boris Johnson today. You could name probably 25 politicians off the top of your head that are in exactly the same boat in terms of they say one thing, they mean another. I disagree with you. I, I mean, this is a, like the, the fellow who got very How cross. You? Well, I do apologise, <laughs> but it is, it is kind of what I'm here for. I, 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 think it's, I think even by the standards of modern politicians, m- many of whom, as you quite rightly remind us, have, have been caught with their um, f- trousers down or their fingers in the metaphorical till, I, I, I think he's head and shoulders above them when it comes to moral corruption. Mm. Uh, he's, 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 I mean, he's, he's, he's Donald Trump-esque in his um, exploits, except that absolutely categorically it has never been suggested that all of his betrayals, meanderings and extramarital affairs were non-consensual. Uh, that, that is the crucial difference, because that's the difference between somebody that you can't really chalk up as, a, as an amiable rogue and somebody who you can. Uh, I just have a very low opinion of... Uh, politicians generally. And I, and I wonder and if that's part of the problem. Because I'm in Belfast yeah, and of we've got Sinn Féin on one hand and the DUP <laughs> on the other and they're both being slated over this renewable heat and uh, incentive. 
yeah. catastrophe that we uh, have. Which is getting here. underreported here, actually. It's going to keep being on my list of things that we need to find out more about. But, um, uh, again, my apologies to you for being remiss. Marty, thank you. Um, as Marty vacates that phone line from Belfast, you, of course, could grab it. It's all gone a bit Boris-flavoured. So I, I am interested also in the Irish angle, that, that question of why you think a television programme for children in Ireland has provided a more cohesive and compelling analysis of where Brexit is than anything that I've seen on British television. Um, I, I would love to take some calls on that. 03456060973. We are also supposed to today be talking about insomnia and university education. Um, we'll see how things shake down. It's 11.01. Um, a few of my Irish listeners suggesting that the reason why that little clip from children's television in the old country uh, is more uh, cohesive and compelling than any of the analysis we've seen on British TV recently is because the Irish are more intelligent and enlightened. Yes, you might say that, Paul. I couldn't possibly comment. I think, actually, the most popular answer is probably the most accurate, and it hadn't occurred to me. Here's another one from Kieran. Our Irish children are obviously more intelligent and well-informed than the best of Brexit cheerleaders. That's probably true. They are now, if they followed that. But a lot of people have pointed... Um, <laughs> pointed out, I shouldn't read Twitter while I'm trying to talk, uh, that it's not political. That's a really good sign of how embedded we've become, isn't it? It's not political. Now, people on, on one side of the fence will believe that it is political because the facts that are being explained don't fit the narrative that they've been sold by people like Boris Johnson and as an earlier call approved the fury that people feel when they begin to suspect that they've been conned is both immense and almost immediately directed at the messenger rather than the person who sent the message it's the person who delivers the message that you've been conned who has to has to cop the screaming and the shouting not the person who undertook the con um, but this is, this is a political analysis, uh, one word, a political. I, and that, I think, is what's so interesting about it. Not least because the BBC is supposed to be completely apolitical. And they've done some very good explainers. Christopher Cook, the uh, Newsnight journalist, did a brilliant uh, factual explainer of that uh, Institute of Economic Affairs document that came out last week and, and, and was riddled with implausibilities. But in terms of the, the, the nitty gritty of the Irish border and the broader issues of customs union and single market, most of us, whether you voted leave or remain, whether you've changed your mind or not, most of us should really be shocked by the fact that this encapsulation is both so simple and so strong. Because I think that we've been denied this sort of journalism. And, and, I mean, I have to take some responsibility for that, but in terms of the broader question, I really don't know why. Have another listen to it. Now, there's been a lot of talk in the news about Brexit recently, and you've probably heard a lot of words like backstop and checkers. But what does it all mean? Well, here's one of Orti's political experts, Paul Cunningham, to explain. The word Brexit means that Britain is exiting or leaving the European Union. The British people voted in favour of leaving the EU in June 2016. But the date Britain will actually leave the EU is March 2019. Both the British and the EU are now trying to agree on what relationship they will have after Brexit. The EU has a single market. This means stuff made in Ireland can travel around the EU without any checks or regulations. Britain still wants to be part of that after Brexit. If Britain chose a deal like Norway, it would be outside the EU but still able to use the single market. But it would mean that people as well as goods could travel freely across borders and Britain doesn't like that. If Britain chose a deal like Switzerland, it could still use the single market. But it would have to obey the same trade rules as the EU and Britain does like that. Britain wouldn't have the problem with rules, courts and people if it had a trade deal like Canada. But it would only have limited use of the single market and Britain wants more than that. The British Prime Minister Theresa May has another idea. Her plan is known as checkers. She wants a better deal than Canada but without as many rules. However, last week in Salzburg and Austria, the EU told her this checkers plan will not work. The Irish government is worried about what's going to happen between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. They want a backstop. That's an unbreakable agreement that there will never be a physical border in Ireland, whether there's a deal or not. When you cross the border today, 
No one stops you to ask for your passport or to look in your car or any trucks. Both the Irish and British governments say they want this to remain even after Brexit next year. However, if Britain wants a deal like Canada, then the EU will want to know what stuff is crossing the border. Both sides are trying to work out how to do that without having to have checks at the border. Both sides agree there should be a backstop, but they can't agree how it will work. If they get that sorted, they'll have longer to work out a trade deal. But they only have a few weeks to sort out the backstop. The clock is ticking. Nine minutes after 11 is the time. Mike in St Albans speaks for many of you today when he writes, Oh my God, that explanation of Brexit from the Irish bloke just clears up the confusion in my head for the last few years, having listened to our so-called experts over here. So uh, the, the political question is chiefly about Boris Johnson. The broader question is about journalism, isn't it? How, how, why has that taken so many of us by surprise? I think it's because it's apolitical, but the BBC is supposed to be apolitical. I'm not, that's why I don't work there anymore, so that I can say things to you that, that could be classed as opinion, but as everybody knows are usually facts. Um, that, that's the bottom line. Why are we not getting more stuff like that from the, from the state broadcaster, from the national broadcaster? I don't know. And it's not a bash the BBC thing. This country would be a million times worse off if we didn't have the BBC than it is now. And, and I think that holds true for the next hundred years. Um, so Boris Johnson, or the broader question of, of why Brexit is still so widely misunderstood. Actually, Boris Johnson could be the answer to the second question, couldn't he? Of course he could. Jeff's in Leatherhead. Jeff, what would you like to say? Yeah, hi, James. Um, hi, just want to correct you, reference Chris Cook and uh, Newsnight. Um, he came out with um, uh, his analysis, and next day he was apologising because he put the wrong computer calculations into the analysis. Yeah, the bulk of the work finish? still holds. That's not why you rang in. No, no, well, the bulk of the work didn't hold. He OK, so my he, one example then, of the BBC doing a good job you'd like me to remove, that's fine. So now we need to address the question of why there aren't more British journalists doing what that Irish fella did. Well, I think there are plenty of um, British journalists um, in, in all the broadsheets and even in the papers like The Sun and The Mirror. So they are explaining things. Um, so how, how, have we ended up, them or not. how have we ended up still thinking that, that Boris's Canada thing might have legs? Well, Boris's Canada thing is the... Um, if you put... The polls have shown that if you put we're checkers... We're not, not talking about polls, polls just finish? No, you can't, because um, we're not talking about polls. We're talking about facts. Right, OK, well, let me talk about facts. So Boris's column today um, shows that the free trade, uh, free trade agreement, Canada Plus style, can absolutely work, and many... Uh, what would the Irish border look like? Well, the Irish border, would, it, it would be very much the same as it is now. <laughs> you can the have, EU have um, said no to that. Well, the, well, they've said no at the moment, but... They've been um, saying no for two and a half years. Well, if well, can I can I just finish? Well, and, you know, you can finish, but it's a con it's a conversation. Seconds, if you say something that's not true, of course it is. That's well, the let, definition of a conversation. Otherwise, well, it would be a monologue. Let, let me let me just just give you just one. Give me five seconds, yeah, without interrupting. Irish border. So the Irish border. So the um, there'll be no checks as, as such. There'll be the checks would be. The 20, EU miles have away said that ports. categorically that can't happen. Well, it can happen because we're going to be leaving anyway, so there will be checks of some kind. You know, you can't leave the EU. Do you know and what the backstop is? Do you need me to play it again, the children's television no, I clip? I know what the backstop but is. Just explain to people who don't well, what the backstop is. That might, be, that might be what the EU wants. No, it's already been agreed. It's already been agreed. That's what Brexit's about. The yeah? backstop so has been. No, Jeff, we're doing is. it again, mate. The backstop has been agreed. The backstop has been agreed uh, in December. But nothing's agreed until everything's agreed. No, as the, you, as the you backstop know, has the been EU agreed. Mantra. No, nothing's agreed until everything's agreed, um, James. <sighs> so, let's, so the let's, backstop so let's hasn't been agreed. It's been agreed, but nothing's. We've we've agreed to pay 40, 000, uh, 40 billion or thirty nine billion, but that won't happen if we don't agree the final package. Yeah, that's how it works with the that's EU. That's not how it works, Jeff, with no, it the is, EU. It it's a negotiation it in two directions. So Boris Johnson's plan is to move the Irish border to the sea. No, Boris Johnson's plan is to move it 20 or 30 miles inland on both sides of the border or at the port. Which the EU um, have said no and, to. And it's not, it's not a border as well, Jeff, why are we it's, doing this, mate? I mean, you're you're now, simply the repeating country, the all... unprovable claims that Boris Johnson makes, and I'm simply repeating the established facts of the current stage. You're saying, no, wait, don't no, you're, worry, you're, there's something around the corner that will be brilliant. Well, you're repeating the facts as you see them. No, I'm repeating the facts, facts as... the country oh, don't believe your facts mate, either. OK, so, so we just, didn't agree the backstop in December, then? 
Well, I've, we've been through that three times No, no, now. you've we just kept repeating that off. phrase, nothing's agreed until everything is agreed, but it doesn't get any cleverer but with repetition. That's on the EU... We can't progress to the next stage. No, we can't progress... So, that's on the EU. That's on the EU website. And any where, deal is website, going to involve. And any is oh, agreed okay, until mate. everything is agreed. And any deal is going to involve, as you've just established, both the divorce agreement and the backstop. Well, if we end up with no deal, then you have a case to make. But Boris Johnson today isn't promoting no deal, Jeff. He's no, promoting he's, a deal. And any deal no, will have to accommodate the agreement. Such. You know how much you hated being agreement. interrupted. He's promoting a free trade agreement. No, he's promoting a deal with the European Union. You can call it a yes. free trade agreement if you want, but it will involve addressing the Irish border and it will involve addressing the financial settlements that we have to make, which have already right. been agreed. So if we well, make any which, deal... Uh, Jeff, well, you, Jeff, deal needs to Jeff, be closed, Jeff, it? Jeff, if we make any deal at all, it will have to accommodate the things that we've already agreed. If we make no deal at all, then you could conceivably jettison the things that have already been agreed and sail off into the wide blue yonder, unfettered by responsibility and commitment. But you've right, misunderstood, Jeff, that. you've misunderstood what happened in December, as, as you keep proving every time you repeat that phrase. No, no, let me respond to that. Oh. Are you are just going to let me... No, you, you respond <laughs> away, Jeff. So, right, so let me respond to that. So, okay, Jeff. We, as, as I've said to you, right at the beginning, on the website... There's no My deal God. unless everything's agreed, yes. OK? So at the moment, we've got 85%, which is kind of agreed, based on the checkers um, that was proposed by May. Which um, so, so 85... But obviously, if checkers goes, and then we're looking at a free trade agreement along Canada style, then that's a new deal. Now, no, it's not, um, Jeff. It's the next well, stage of the negotiation that was recorded in December of having established the divorce payment and the backstop. There is nothing on the table that involves a deal which reverses from the commitments that have already been made. That would be called, and I hope this isn't too complicated for you, that would be called no deal. Well, I'm sorry we're not all as bright as you, James. It's and not I'm, a question you know, of brightness, but, Jeff. It's a question but, of listening. Uh, yeah, I know you've, you've it's not the size of your brain. It's the amount of wax in your ear. Now, listen again. Yeah, well, in sure December, you, you, you it was agreed. About people being in than December, you are, it was agreed. No, well, you just keep talking. You can't listen. In December, it was agreed that we would make the divorce payment and that the border in Ireland was inviolate. If any deal is done subsequently, it will have to accommodate those two commitments. You now understand this. You didn't when you rang in. That that's not my fault. I do, uh, no, you're wrong. You're wrong. OK, I'm wrong. It's 11.17. Um, head teachers marching in London in protest at the terms and conditions under which they have to work. We will be catching up with events there momentarily. Uh, yeah, you're probably right, actually. I shouldn't say the divorce bill when we come to the financial settlement that's already been agreed between the EU and the UK, because it isn't divorce bill. It's a financial settlement. It's a, an agreement to meet the financial commitments that we've already made but I, I think callers like Jeff possibly answer the questions that I'm asking unintentionally um, if like you and I, there is no polite way of putting this that's the problem I, I appreciate that it leaves one open to the accusation of condescension but if you don't understand what you're talking about try and think of it like this when it comes to the deal and why Boris Johnson's bloviations on the front page of today's Daily Telegraph are just a, a reanimation of something that is already dead um, Think of the final deal that we do with the European Union, and I'm taking a bit of inspiration to, from that Irish fella on the children's TV programme, but I mean, he didn't even need to resort to analogy, so he's probably a clearer thinker than me. Think of it as a pot, OK? Think of the deal, the final treaty, which is what it will be, whether you want to call it a deal or a trade agreement or whatever it may be. It's a pot, OK? Now, into that pot last December were put two very separate things. One of them was the backstop which means there can be no hard border in Ireland, which means there can't really be any checks on the border in Ireland. So that's where the nonsense about, oh, well, we'll just do it 20 miles away from the border becomes... I, I, again, I apologise, it is going to sound condescending, but some people get spoken down to because they are so far down there. Um, that's bonkers, right? So that's the first thing that's gone into the pot. There can be no border in Ireland. Both sides have agreed on that. The second thing that went into the pot was the totting up of the financial situation, the, the, the things that we are committed to contribute towards. Historically, 
um, and moving forward will no longer have to contribute towards, but we're still in debt, as it were. We're still in, in uh, what's, it, what's the word, in arrears, or, or we've still got commitments that we need to make because when we agreed to make them, we agreed to make them for a fixed period of time. That's where the £39 billion comes in. So that went in the pot as well. I, I genuinely think this is a public service, and I'm genuinely taking inspiration from that Irish fellow, because people like Jeff are so blind to the most simple of facts that you have to keep trying to help them. So there's the pot that will be the final treaty, right? And in the pot last December was put the backstop agreement on Northern Ireland and the financial settlement with the European Union. So where that phrase comes in now is nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. That kicks in if the pot exists. So if we reach the end of the negotiating process and have a deal or a free trade agreement or, or whatever you want to call it, if the pot is still there, the results of the negotiation is a document, a treaty that is signed by all 28 countries, then those two things will have to be in the pot. That's what the agreement in December was. So nothing is agreed until everything is agreed refers only to the existence of the pot at the end of the negotiations. If we march away with no deal, which incredibly is looking more likely all the time, if we march away with no deal, then the two things in the pot can be jettisoned. I don't know how you would cope with the Irish border question, because the first thing that the World Trade Organization would do is insist on checks at that border, something that decent people like Jeff just don't understand, because indecent people like Boris Johnson keep lying to them. So the first thing the WTO would do would be to bring in a border, which is going to cause all sorts of problems, um, some of them potentially fatal, although I, I appreciate hyperbole doesn't work very well in the context of Brexit yet. It will do when it all starts coming true. That, that is the first thing that you could realistically jettison. And the second thing is that ludicrous Dominic Raab suggestion that we won't pay our dues, we won't pay our bills. We'll be the bloke who runs out of the pub when it's our round. OK, which I think would be plausible, probably legal. I don't know about legal, but it would be plausible in the event that there's no deal. Do you see? So that phrase, which I, I appreciate has become a mantra, and I think I understand why, that phrase, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed, refers to the end process of the treaty. What was agreed in December was that if we reach the end process of the treaty, the Irish backstop and the financial settlement will definitely be in it. So the only circumstances in which we don't pay our dues or we don't observe the backstop in Northern Ireland is if there is no deal. Ergo, to use a word that he no doubt employs himself on a regular basis, ergo, Boris Johnson's suggestion denies the simplest realities. And decent people like Jeff continue to believe it because the alternative is... Oh my God, I got conned. So in answer to the question, why is Boris Johnson still a thing? What we've realised through listening to a couple of callers today is that if we admit that Boris Johnson isn't a thing, then we have to admit that we've been mugged by people we thought were our friend. So Boris Johnson has to keep appearing on the front page of the Daily Telegraph. Otherwise, people like Jeff and Christopher and a few of my more um, uh, 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 heated correspondents are going to have to admit that they've been wrong all along. And that, I'm afraid, is not an opinion. Or at least it's the best available explanation of the observable facts. So in the spirit of Occam's razor, them's the bristles. Or well, maybe not. Joseph's in Plasto. Joseph, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello, man. Um, I'd like to give a, maybe a, a, a bit of an explanation of, I think, what might add to what you just said, mm. which is how a rational person can continue to support something even when it's clear that it's not going to be in their best interest. And it's through something called the dollar auction game. Yes. Which is a real thing that really works. Basically... If you, uh, are you, like, are you jumping the gun a bit? Because the people we've been talking to don't yet accept the first premise that you made, which is that mm. that they are going to be worse, in a worse position than before. They, they still deny that. But I'm interested in knowing what the dollar auction game is, because it, it's a phrase I've seen and I don't really understand. But we, we well, are also talking about people who would deny that they are now choosing between bad and worse. They still think better is on the horizon. I think the part of that is... Um 
it's necessary for them to continue to publicly express that, even if privately they have doubts about that. OK, but yeah, maybe. They, the, the game is it's really simple. I've got 10 quid and I've got two players. And I say, you can buy this 10 quid for any amount of money, but any money that you offer from either of you, no matter who wins, I get to keep. Which means that one person bids one quid, it's rational for them to outbid each other all the way up to nine quid because they're still getting ten pounds for nine quid. Yeah. But then one of them goes, I don't want to lose my money, so I'm just going to call it quits, and I'm going to say I will buy your ten pounds for ten pounds. At which point the game doesn't end because the other person goes, well, now I'm going to lose nine pounds, or I can pay eleven pounds and only lose one pound. Oh, boy. I thought you were doing a really bad job of explaining this, and now suddenly the penny's dropped, and I completely understand what you're saying. So it becomes more about minimising your losses rather than maximising your profit. Mate, that's it, exactly. Exactly. So people keep outbidding each other, and it can go up and up and up. So Boris Johnson on the front page of today's Daily Telegraph is essentially saying, I will pay 12 quid for that £10, and the people cheering him... uh, Why why are people cheering him? Because they are the ones paying it. He is, he is, he is the person playing the game. He's got them to play the game. Everyone else is bidding their time and their emotion and their cultural capital and their reputation by supporting him. And they know that no matter what happens, they're going to lose that to an extent. Yes. So they're sitting there going, well, if I'm going to lose no matter what, I may as well lose while electing a prime minister. Or really? I may as well lose and win by getting the Brexit that I want or the Donald Trump that I want or the whatever it is. So So it becomes an emotional hit rather than a political one. It's more a sense of, yes, I've just chopped off my legs, but the other bloke's furious. The other bloke's furious, and I won. And I won. I got got the person, even if I know that he's a philandering yoghurt pot, yeah. He's my prime minister who has won. Right. And it's and then, then you can hold out the hope that he'll do something good in the future and you can hang your hat on that. And and that, but, that notion of binary sides, which I, I I still don't fully appreciate, but that the, we took a call when that balloon of um Donald Trump was gonna go up over London and I'll never forget it actually. It's in the book. The bloke said you're on the same side as Sadiq Khan and Brendan Cox. And I thought, what the hell is he actually talking about? And I've thought about it ages since. But once you've established battle lines like that, then facts and politics cease to matter. And it is just a perception of victory. So that line, you lost, get over it, still, I mean, it's a lot, lot, lot quieter now. The line now is, please stop pointing out the scale of my idiocy. Um, Although they phrase it slightly differently, usually in two words. But Sorry, there's only... Go on. There's, there's, there's one other thing on that, which is the actual game only works between the two players. Yeah, of course. But when it's politics, the game also works when they're bidding against the person who isn't playing, who's sitting at the sidelines, calmly pointing out that they're losing their money. So that, it's like that, now... Yeah, don't knock it, Joe, if it's a living. <laughs> no, 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 but he's <laughs> doing the sensible thing. So you're, you're, you're getting a person who is supporting... Johnson, even though they know that he's, yes. but, you know, not the best, or Brexit. Or and whatever. that's why they get so angry? Yeah. When, when, when you point out what they're doing? Yeah, because they know it's irrational, like you do in the game. You know you're losing money, but you're just not losing as much money. And if you so stop pointing that, it out, then I can console myself with the knowledge that I can still beat the other fella, even though we're both going to end up hurting ourselves. Yeah, we, we're both hurt. We, I'm going to accept that. I, I'm hurting, but I won. Caller of the week. I don't know why I thumped the table. That was a bit partridge-esque, and we don't normally do caller of the week. But I, I, I love it when I learn stuff, Joseph. And I, I was beginning to despair that I was going to learn anything today, or oh, intentionally. Uh, it's 32 minutes after 11, because uh, about a thousand head teachers are protesting in London today at the economic circumstances imposed upon them, which they contend are compromising their ability to teach our children. They're heading to Downing Street to protest about crumbling school buildings and. Um, issues including class sizes, um, this because the per capita funding of schools has fallen, according to the Institute of Fiscal Studies, has fallen by about 8% since David Cameron and George Osborne got in. A couple of caveats before uh, the gammon explodes. EU immigration is a net 
contributor to the British economy. So people who've come here from the European Union pay in more than they take out. That includes the education of their children. There are more people here, ergo there are more people in classes, but if the parents of those people in those classes are European Union workers, then they are actually contributing a plus positive to the British economy. So that has no place at all in this debate unless you're gammon. Matthew Thompson is neither, and he is in the midst of the marchers on their way to Downing Street. Matthew, what's going on? I am indeed, James. There have been lots of teacher protests in recent years, but I think what makes this one different is that it's almost entirely made up of headmasters and headmistresses, the boss class, if you will, the people actually running things. And as you say, several hundred of them have gathered in Parliament Square this morning. They've just quite literally set off on a march up towards Downing Street, and they're here to demand extra funding for schools and I spent the morning canvassing opinion amongst some of them as to why they've taken that unusual step of leaving their schools and coming down to London to protest. If we get the government to listen to what we have to say today it'll be the best day's work we've ever done. We're not angry with them, we're just very, very disappointed. We know times are tough in public services but they are choosing to spend it on bailing out failing academies, free schools that have failed. They do have the money but they're not choosing to spend it in the right way. We want a fair deal, we want fair funding for all of our schools so that we are able to offer a world-class education to prepare our, all of our children. I have to say, James, that the, the slogan, we're not angry, we're disappointed, has to be the most schoolmasterly protest slogan I think I've ever heard. But I should just say that the Department for Education continues to insist, of course, that school funding will be at its highest ever level, 43.5 billion by 2020. But that's really just a rhetorical trick. It's technically true, of course, but in cash terms. So anyone with the, the faintest grasp of economics knows that what matters is real terms funding and per pupil funding after things like inflation and pupil numbers are taken into account and as you said at the beginning the Institute for Fiscal Studies that widely respected think tank says that per pupil, per pupil spending has fallen by 8% since 2010 partly as because of a surge of the numbers of pupils but that directly contradicts the government's own assertion so the message really here today is Mr Hammond we need some more money please or else and the likelihood of getting it I appreciate that's not really your sort of field of expertise but but what's the feeling among the marchers a direct line to Philip Hammond <laughs> myself but I, I, I'm sure he would say that actually relatively to other departments, of course, we know that health and education spending have been quite relatively protected and, mm. and some of the deeper cuts have fallen to things like transport, communities and local government, defence. Uh, so he would probably stand on that record. Uh, obviously, we have a budget coming soon, so who knows what's in the mind of the Chancellor. But I would have thought that massive largesse at this stage is probably slightly unlikely. I do love that slogan. Is it on any banners? Your brain works exactly the same as mine. I saw, a brilliant one. I saw a straight out of funding, which for any gangster rap yeah. fans amongst the audience will know is a bit of a pun on Dr. Dre, which I thought was one of the, the, the better protest banners I've seen for a long time. But no, the, uh, the, uh, we're, not we're not just angry, disappointed was, was merely uh, a throwaway line, but I quite like it. So you've let, you've seen, say, Mr. Hammond, you've, you've let the country down, you've let <laughs> the school down, but most of all, you've let yourself down. That's your job, so great stuff. I'll keep reports of that, keeping tabs on that. And as he quite rightly points out, that remarkable element of this march is that the head teachers are protesting ordinarily when industrial action and don't, don't shoot me down in flames for this obviously m many head teachers will probably be on the other side of a picket line but ordinarily when teachers protest or strike head teachers see their workload increase immeasurably because they have to plug the holes and keep everything um, alive uh, we will take a couple more calls on the Brexit issue and then I think we're going to move on to insomnia um, if you're just tuning in I've already done all the jokes about this program being the best available cure for that condition but first this Globals make some noise for those who don't get heard this is LBC Last year, we asked you to join us to make a difference to the lives of children across the UK for LBC's charity, Globals Make Some Noise. Your support was phenomenal. We raised three and a half million pounds. And we gave a voice to some brilliant small charities that otherwise would never get heard. 
It's a week to go now until Make Some Noise Day, and I've got a brilliant prize for you. Thanks to Grand Velas, Riviera Maya and Dyla Flight, you could be off on holiday to Mexico. You'll stay in a five-star hotel surrounded by beautiful sandy beaches, and all your food and drink is included. I'll say that again. All your food and drink is included. So, what do you need to do? Couldn't be simpler. You text the word Mexico. Okay? M-E-X-I-C-O. You text the word Mexico to our usual number 84850. Text the word Mexico to 84850. A voluntary donation of just three pounds from every text goes straight to make some noise. And you, of course, get entered into the draw with the prize of a holiday in Mexico. You've got until midday on the 5th of October to enter, so don't hang around. Keep your phone handy because we may be calling you. We'll have your number, of course, because you're going to have used your phone to text us the word Mexico to 84850. And you need to be 18 or over. Standard network rates apply. You're playing across participating radio stations and regions. Head to lbc.co.uk for more details. Globals make some noise for those who don't get heard on LBC. I can't tell you how big a deal that is, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm off script now, as it were. But one of the things we do is visit to deliver the cheques. And quite often when you get a call from some of the colleagues in the building who aren't involved in programme making, your heart sinks a bit because you think, oh, what am I going to have to do now? I'm going to have to give a speech to a bunch of accountants. But when the, when the make some noise lot come calling... I'll tell you what, you'd struggle to feel more fulfilled than on a day when you've gone to a charity that can't quite believe the benefits they will accrue from the money that you have donated. And I make no apology at all for yanking on your heartstrings on days like today because I do it and I take the checks to those places and I see the children. And more importantly, I see the mums and dads and I see the workers, many of whom can be volunteers. And I feel and I hear and I see the difference that your money makes to their lives. And I'll tell you something else about the kids that get helped by Make Some Noise. The best thing we can do for them, whatever their illness or condition or position may be, is make them feel less alone. Something I learned from, from a lad who came in here who uh, was born with the lower half of one arm missing. And what happens is the families go off on trips with other families with, with infant missing limb issues. And I never forget what he said to me, just about everyone else was the same. No one, I didn't stand out, he said. When you've got an ego like mine, you spend your life dreaming of standing out. You listen to a little lad like that, issuing such simple, singular words, does two things. It makes you feel about one inch high. And it makes you realise just how important the work that these people do is. I don't stand out. For one weekend of the year, no one asks what's wrong with me, James. 84850. It's 11.46. Yeah, I'll just read you this, actually, from Tony, who's in Slough, because it, it, it brought a tear to the old eye, Tony. James, I don't normally give to charity, because you do hear of issues where you feel your money isn't actually going to the needed and, and being used properly. I've given money to homeless people before, but I've bought them dog food for their dog, mostly, because, again, I'm concerned they might use my money for alcohol or drugs, etc. But seeing how you just explained that you go there yourself and see the benefits of the money raised by Globals Make Some Noise, I want to contribute on this occasion, and the next text from me will be Mexico. Thank you. No, thank you. 11.51 is the time. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I'm hoping to do an hour on insomnia from 12, because I think it's huge. I'm utterly unsurprised that double um, the numbers of people actually going to the doctors with insomnia. Uh, and I'm utterly unsurprised that smartphones and technology are credited with taking some of the blame. And I am going to have a little bit of fun with the issue, because I, I think I have some brilliant cures for insomnia. Um, but I also know that it's a really, really serious issue. Um, the ITV newsreader Tom Bradby got teased a bit when it emerged that he'd had months off work due to insomnia, but it won't just be insomnia. It, it, it will be stress levels that are so huge that your brain can't shut down and your brain can't rest. And it, it's a condition I know a little bit about. A good, good, good pal of mine really, really went to the wire with this. And so although I will reserve the right to... Um, bring a little light and shade into the conversation. I want you to know that if you're going to be listening from a serious perspective to the conversation we're going to have about insomnia, that I am well aware of the seriousness of 
the situation, okay? But I also have some quite funny tactics that work for me. And I used to suffer from it quite badly. I, I used to have, but I told you, didn't I? About three or four years ago, I was having real long, dark tea times of the soul. I think it was linked to losing my dad and a little bit of a delayed reaction to that. Uh, but anyway, I've got, I've got some thoughts, and you've got some thoughts, and together, we've put together a programme. Speaking of putting together a programme, a lot of reaction coming in for Joseph, who rang in from Plasto to tell us about the dollar auction. It's a sign that I'm growing up. Do you know? You might find that hard to believe, but often when, when a caller rings in and does something brilliant and brings in some knowledge that I was utterly lacking, a few years ago I'd have been a little bit chippy. I'd have been, oh, yeah, all right, so you know more than I do. So a sign that I'm finally maturing is that I now feel nothing but joy that my brain now has more knowledge in it than it had before Joseph in Plasto rang in. And, and in terms of Brexit, it's the first thing that has actually made sense of the position that, that people are still holding without imparting the idea that they're credulous fools or, 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 or stupid. Because the, the, the idea that what they're trying to do is minimise the loss while accepting silently that they're going to be worse off than they would have been if they've never entered the game, that is pretty close to a perfect analysis. So I shall urge my internet gnomes and elves not just to... Um, publish the calls of people embarrassing themselves today, like Christopher and Jeff, but also to publish that call of Joseph, which I think was of almost um, equal value to the commentary from Ireland of <laughs> the children's television programme that explained Brexit better than anything I've heard from any prominent Brexiter. But we'll take a couple more calls on that, one or two, and then we'll crack on with insomnia, if we're still awake. Jonathan's in Maidenhead. Jonathan, what would you like to say? Yeah, hi, James. Oh. Um, first time on your show, my, my fiancé is an inveterate listener, mm. um, so I sort of am, am aware of you and your show. Uh, you don't, just, just, because someone, no, on, just because someone rang in and said he'd never heard of me doesn't yeah. mean that everybody else has to establish their credentials. Your, your, your fiancé sounds like a woman of impeccable taste, Jonathan, for at least two reasons. Now, what did you ring in to tell me. Well, she, she starts off and I've heard her occasionally saying, no, nah, James, what is exercising you this morning? Is how she engages with you. But, <laughs> Love it. Uh, uh, James, hey, you know I, what you've got to get for Christmas, don't you, Jonathan? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that, don't, don't, I um, won't mention it. I'll leave it hanging. Um, James, um, just going back, the show may have moved on, but I just wanted to pick up uh, on the Boris Johnson Emperor's Clothes point. If yes. You, if, you, if you can... If I can go back to that. Of course. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, you and I are probably on slightly different sides of the sort of middle ground debate here. I mean, you, you know, I, I'm a reluctant, uh, a, a reluctant Brexiteer, sort of middle ground city solicitor, not a party member, have voted Labour, have voted Conservative. But I, I was completely in agreement with you on this Boris, John, Boris Johnson issue. Mm. And I have actually phoned Tom Sawbridge's show. I don't understand it. I, I, I think, you know... He's a, a, a ruthless uh, and relentless careerist. He stands for nothing. And it's also a mystery to me how he still commands the interest that he does. I, yes. w one observation, he gets a platform from The Telegraph, of course, which really irritates me. I, the proprietors of The Telegraph and the current editor, um, which drives me potty. I mean, you've got your, your issues that sort of send you off. One of them <laughs> is the pictures uh, and, well, apart from the coverage he gets through his column yes. and the articles. but. It, regularly, once every three months, there'll be a front page picture of him in some Churchillian pose. Of yes. course, he's a, a huge, a huge uh, admirer of Churchill, as many of us are. I'm sure you are as well. I certainly am. But the difference is, we don't think we Churchill. This man seems to think he is, and the, the, the Telegraph encourages this. Worst of all are these pictures of him in military type poses on a on a patrol boat or in a, in a tank with that sort of. And, you know, this is rubbish. This is a man who, who never went near, unlike Churchill, never exposed himself to danger, has never done anything real. Do you know that you, uh, you're, you're, I, I completely agree with you. There's a very good, I haven't read it yet, but it was very glowingly reviewed yesterday, new biography of Churchill by um, yes. Andrew Roberts. And, and yes. what occurred to me, because it, it detailed, the review I read detailed quite um, generously the, the, the terrible mistakes that he'd made and the scandals that he was involved with prior to the late 30s. And, and that, because I was... Like you, I get very, very irritated by Johnson's sort of Churchillian yeah. fetishization. But what struck me was that Churchill, he said something about, if I hadn't made mistakes, I wouldn't have done anything. 
I wouldn't have yeah. made anything. And, and that's the difference between them, is that Johnson's such a querulous coward. He never actually does anything meaningful except resign or make speeches or write columns. Whereas, for good or for ill, Churchill came to public prominence by doing really, really big things, like quitting entire parties or, yeah. or sadly, masterminding disastrous campaigns like Gallipoli. Gallipoli. James, I think that absolutely, you know, you and I actually are completely on the same page as this because one of the sort of slight lines that is peddled is, you know, Churchill was a controversial character mm. too, but come at the man, come at the hour. But your point is absolutely spot on. He, he, he made some terrible mistakes, yes. but he was at all times a bigger man. As you know, from, he, he was a man who, who saw frontline combat. He had men shot next to him. Uh, he, he, he was just, in every sense, a huge character. Boris Johnson is not. As I said on Tom Sawbridge's show, he is, if ever there was a charlatan, Boris Johnson is a charlatan. He wasn't a great mayor of London. Uh, you know, he, he, this is sort of, you, we, we, we've got the Liverpool, Hillsborough, that, you know, uh, Nazir and Ratcliffe, etc. It just goes on and on. So and, what, and then, it, what then do you think explains the, the, the reverence in which he's still held by Sir MP? And it's Tom Swarbrick, I should stress. Uh, Sorry, uh, Tom, uh, Tom, it's Tom, great. Sorry, it's great that the show gets a mention, but I, I think he'd probably want me to, to <laughs> remind you of his correct surname. The, the, okay. What, what do you think explains... He's a nice young man. He anyway. is a very nice young man, yeah. exactly. He's a, so he's, a very, very, he's a lovely young man. What, um, what do you think explains the people who still hold Boris Johnson in, in such lofty regard? Oh, well, I think two things. I, I think they're, they're the, the ones who, I think the number who actually hold him in lofty regard is quite, in my view, I don't have statistics on this, but mm. my suspicion would be it's actually not that great a number. There are another group who's, who are desperate to find, I think, within the Tory party, but it's a bit like the situation with Labour at the moment, the difference between MPs, Labour membership, and Labour voters. Now, it seems to me yeah, where, really where there is point. a faction that is, which is quite strongly pro Boristol is in the Tory membership, sort of perhaps home counties membership. I don't think amongst lots of Tory supporters he's held in that high regard. And, he's and picked certainly up amongst UK. Tory MPs, you'll he's... be aware that a number of them are appalled by the man. Well, that's true. So we have a situation where I think some of the Tory membership, the more sort of conservative, uh, the strident Brexiteers Tory membership, are desperately looking for a strong figure. And, and I think that go, that's part of the whole thing. I think, you know, for this, this situation, we and Theresa May, bless her, she's a bit hapless. Uh, you know, she's, she's soldiering on. But we don't have a Thatcher or a Blair. I think we, you know, I think people, and both of them, deeply flawed characters, but huge, huge personalities. Just a se yeah, just a sense of shoulders, isn't it? Yeah, uh, shoulders, absolutely. And I think people misguidedly think that Boris Johnson has got is going shoulders. to provide those shoulders. Yeah. With actually on the right wing of the Tory party, a man with almost no shoulders physically, but is the actual intellect. And I'm no, I'm not saying I agree with all his policies, but, his policies, but Jacob <laughs> Rees-Mogg. <laughs> we were doing so well. We were getting on so famously <laughs> until you described Jacob, Jacob Rees-Mogg as an intellect. Jacob, Jacob Rees-Mogg, and I'm not, but even if you listen to your own shows, you listen to the taxi drive, the, you know, yes. people on quite a right-wing agenda. A lot of them are actually talking about Jason, Jacob. They, they are, but, but that's because they've seen the light with Boris. And my view, which clearly doesn't tally with yours, is that they will also see the light with Jacob Rees-Mogg, because it pains me to admit it, but Boris Johnson is considerably cleverer than the other fellow. I